Okay, so here is my concentration. Um, I'm going to talk about it a bit here just because it might be fun for you guys to look at. Um, and of course, 100 characters and spaces isn't much room to really talk about my stuff. Um, so yeah, I guess I might as well get to it. So I have submitted um, 11 pieces so far. I am like working on another but it's not yet finished. I think we only have to submit 10 this year because of special circumstances, so I'm just gonna go through them and see um, what's interesting about them. Uh, there's one piece that's missing here that I just took off, uh, decided not to put in the 10 pieces, and that one I can maybe pull up as well, but I mean, the point of that one is uh, basically Xenobots, and I'll go, that, go into that later. But here's the first piece, so you can basically see, um, like, fairly evenly distributed elements in the composition with like little lettering next to each of one of these. Uh, these are lamprey embryos. So during my junior year or the summer between my junior and senior year, I was able to uh, take part as an, in an internship at uh, the Bronner Lab at Caltech, which studies developmental biology. Um, the model, one of the unique models that they work with aside from others, like uh, I think they work with Sinopis and they work with uh, zebrafish, um, and they actually have lamp like a tank of lamprey there. And uh, one of my jobs during the summer was to basically um, like maintain the health of like lamprey cultures. Um, these were specifically like lamprey embryos, so they're at a pretty young age at this point where I drew them. Um, I decided to draw some at like varying points in development. Um, you can see that I. Um, I mean, I, I personally really like like the stage around like T20. So that's um, that's actually the um, how, how they define um, lamprey embryo age. Uh, a guy named uh, Dr. Tahara, I, I don't remember his first name. Um, he devised this like staging table in like 1988, I think, um, where you basically like can determine like the age or like how <coughs> far along it is. Um, in the Tahara um, staging by like a certain number and like certain features that they have. So like T20 and T21, you'll notice they have like, you start to see like the, like, st like the beginnings of like a little head forming, which is pretty cool to look at. Um, so yeah, you can see that in like T20, there are also some younger ones that look a bit more spherical. Like you can see it's T19, it's kind of like the neural, uh, neural, neural, yeah, neural stage of like development kind of there. Um, there's some like, malformed ones that you toss out like for example um this one um which has like basically like almost like bubble kind of things like coming off of it that means like it's it's probably dead already um or there are problems with development and here's like an earlier um stage that's like about like ta or something i i, I don't know it's been a while but yeah that's that's like the moralist more moral stage which i think is like latin for like blackberry or something like that um because of its like shape um and here you'll notice I did a lot of experimentation with uh, stippling and cross-hatching. So you'll notice some of the embryos are cross-hatched, like this one and some are stippled, like uh, these these few. Um, and this one I tried like different types of shading, like this was, I, I forget what kind of uh, like hatching this is, but it's like non-parallel um, lines and this is like, yeah, parallel, just hatching. Um, that's like, yeah, contour and then yeah, you know, the different styles of shading I experimented with this in this piece. So it was really a learning experience. I didn't think too much about composition at this, this point, and I completed this before I formally started my concentration in senior year. So I thought it was still in line with the rest of the, com co uh, the concentration because um, it touches on evolution. So the concentration overall, it is supposed to focus on like discovering or um, representing certain um, animals from evolution visually um, and like trying to kind of kind of like da Vinci kind of deal um, trying to discover certain things about uh, evolution through drawing animals that's basically the point of the concentration this next one um, I tried to do a tr like in terms of when I did the pieces chronologically I kind of wanted to go um, forward in time or no uh, was it yeah I tried to um, go forward in time generally, but ultimately in terms of order, I ended up uh, having them kind of out of order because um, what I wanted to do was um, order them in terms of 
like mostly compositional complexity and depth of thought in terms of composition. Um, so yeah, things are out of order. But this one, this next one, uh, this is a picture of tunicates. So tunicates are um, also called like orochordates, but I don't know how common that term is. Uh, they are also chordates, and they are probably the close. They're the close, most closely related to um, vertebrates, which is interesting um, to think about. Um, they're actually more closely related than like lancelets and like hemichordates, which, which is interesting. But uh, yeah, they're also used in a as a model uh, in developmental biology, biology specifically like Siona. Um, yeah, the genus Siona is used in developmental biology. And I just want to draw the tunica here because I thought it was interesting that um, like in terms of the theme of evolution, uh, I drew the, uh, yeah, you can see this is the this is actually a tunicate larva. It's not to scale, of course, but yeah, this is a tunicate larva and this is an adult tunicate. Um, the interesting thing about uh, it is that, yeah, I, I added some labeling just to like show the um, how, how these body parts correspond to each other in the larval and adult stage. But it's interesting that there's a lot less anatomical complexity in the adult stage than the uh, larval stage. And that's a really interesting also because um, it looks so weird, like you never think the sea squirt is so like closely related to us even, but I mean if you look at the larval stage it also almost looks like a tadpole with, with all the features that it has, it also has like a notochord and all of that, which is really interesting. And that's kind of wanted, what I wanted to tackle with this piece. Um, I didn't really use much, uh, I didn't really t use too complex of a con uh, like a composition here, it's just really everything framed in the center and there's not much text either. Um, this is one of my earlier pieces and I mean it was a good process. I also tried a different type of pen. Um, I tried using like a Copic like pen which was actually really crappy, I wouldn't recommend getting it, but it actually gave me some really nice lines within the first like few minutes of using it. Uh, like really nice and like crisp lines, but then like er, later it really went to shit. So like I, I would not recommend you buy one of those, just stick with Micron um, if you want to do art in general. Um, but I mean that's uh, at least for my concentration. So this next one, this is actually one I created later in the process and <laughs> it's not really um. Yeah, it's not like really conventional, um, like evolution, uh, per se. Like it's it's not like you, what you think of like you know like uh, tunicates, like amphioxus, that kind of evolution. But rather, like this is a different type of evolution. So I wanted to look at uh, cellular automata and how that is reflected in the cone snail. So the cone snail or the geography cone snail, um, I think, is also called. Um, it has like a pretty, really interesting pattern on its shell that is like seems to be pretty random, and that's actually formed uh, with the same process as cellular automata. So um, the the like image in the back with pixels is um, from John. It's it's a it's an entity from John Conway's Game of Life. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I, I feel bad about that because he he unfortunately passed away recently. This is the last thing you'd want to be remembered by, but. I mean, still, I think there's a lot of interesting stuff made um, with that ga game, um, I guess you could call it. But yeah, what, what's in the back is uh, the Gosper glider gun, which is a, um, it's a structure in uh, Conway's Game of Life that basically, um, so like the Game of Life has a certain number of rules that governs like whether a tile is alive or dead. So alive being like black and dead being white, basically. So following those rules, the Gosper glider gun is like this oscillating almost like machine that like um, it periodically produces these little things called gliders that um, will also like move across the screen without degenerating or anything like that. So yeah, um, that's probably one of the most iconic um, structures from the game of life, so that's why I decided to put it in the background. The um, the composition is also, or the concept rather, is inspired by Christopher Zetterstrand, who is you, if you play if you played Minecraft, um, you'll notice that they have paintings in that game, and the paintings in that game are pixelated. But if you look at the actual um, yeah, the, if you look at the original iterations of them created by Christopher Zetterstrand, um, you'll notice that they feature um, non pixelated. Uh, aspects of um, aspects of the painting uh, juxtaposed with pixelated aspects of the painting. So for example, if you know one of the largest paintings in Minecraft with the, sc the skull with the fire around it, 
um, the real version is actually, um, it features a skull that's like realistic with pixelated flames, which looks even cooler in my opinion. Um, same thing with the one with like the sumo or the like Kung Fu fighters. Um, and yeah, I mean, I definitely encourage you to check that guy's work out. It's really cool. And that's kind of what I was thinking about when making this piece. So yeah. Yeah, I drew in grid lines with a ruler, pretty crude process, but I mean, it still ultimately like looked good enough that I was like, fuck it, let's, let's just go with it. And I executed this piece. So yeah, that's my third, um, fourth piece. So this is also lamprey style piece. This was later in the process when I was working in the lab. So you'll notice they've grown a bit by now. And this is really detailed. This is when I had access to some of the later stages of the lamprey embryos. So you'll notice these... Um, these are like Tahara stage 24, um, where you really start to see them like become looking like uh, like a lamprey, where they have like the like yolk and they've got like a fully formed head. They um, yeah, a person that I worked with in the lab who is a researcher at U Chicago, Tetsuro Miyashira, uh, he likened these to looking like little dragons, which is very poetic. Um, I, I that got me thinking. Yeah, this is what a T24. Uh, embryo kind of looks like they kind of like wriggle around yeah this is the stage you'll notice they look like very mobile this is the stage where they really start to move before then they're kind of stuck in the um uh what is it the, the corian so they can't really move around that much but like around here they'll start to move around in the corian you can like decorinate them um so that they can like they really have full uh range of movement so yeah here in a few more pictures of that and here's like a little visual uh basically detailing how they develop uh, over, like, in later stages. So, like, here's T19, the Nerua kind of stage, um, and then here's where, where that kind of, um, like, growth starts to happen. So, like, that's kind of like the yolk area, and you'll notice, like, the head kind of gets longer. It looks a bit more eel-like throughout the process. Like, T25, it kind of looks like, uh, like a gun or something, which is really funny. Um, they have, they all have this like little embryo thing like curled here. It's very cute. Um, and here's T26 where it's pretty much straight here. Um, the interesting thing with stages past T26 is that T26 through 30, their head shape kind of changes throughout the whole process. So this is like a rough diagram of what the head would look like if you saw under a microscope. Um, yeah, I say that the shape of the lamprey head changes and they kind of wiggle around like this um, I took a video of them and kind of saw how they move around. They just wriggle um, Yeah, and as you look at the later stages like the t28 the head is like um, you can tell it's kind of like flattish t29 you can see this clear um, Like kind of it's kind of like pointed tapered in and you can see this uh, like black and region starting to form and t30 they their heads become uh, roundish um, Here's like a visual of T twenty nine lamprey or T thirty lamprey, I think, moving around as well, like wriggling around, and you can see some of its uh, body parts in detail. So here's like the yolk, here like the guts, like here. Um, there's it's a pharynx, and yeah, its heart is like somewhere here, but actually its heart is there, I think. I might have not have drawn it in too well. Here's another thing that I saw during my work time in the lab. I actually spotted a double-headed lamprey in one of the samples I was looking at, which is super rare, actually. Um, it was caused by one of um, one of the female lamprey had like a maternal effect gene that came into effect in like a very small amount of lamprey embryos. And it produced this double-headed lamprey, which lived pretty long. So it was pretty unusual to see this because um, the T26 went, like is pretty late, and it lived until like past T30, where it was double-headed. And I drew it at that stage. Unfortunately, um, it was. I mean, double-headed lampreys can't live very long because what they do um, early in their larval stage is they like secrete mucus, I think, to feed. And when they have two heads, it kind of like something goes around that process and it kind of like the mucus suffocates them so it's really hard to um for them to like survive they also like develop heart problems and stuff i think um as a result so these these guys don't live too long but this is a pretty interesting case so yeah uh, tetsu and miyashira ended up uh actually preserving this specific lamprey and um yeah that's i think it's in chicago or somewhere now but yeah it's being used for good purpose which makes me happy. Um, here's my next piece, which is very different in terms of the subjects. So these things, these things look weird as fuck. So you might be wondering, like, what are these? Well, these uh, are reconstructions of animals from the Cambrian uh, area. 
era, like you may remember that term from like the Cambrian explosion, you know, so it's the time when there's a lot, there's like a huge amount of uh, diversity in terms of form uh, that came about in the animal kingdom. Um, I mean, the reasons are debated, but that's a story for another day. What I was representing here was the idea um, in terms of evolution. Uh, it's like an evolving understanding of evolution, which is funny. So what I drew on the left side of the piece with the, this figure and this figure, figure were past reconstructions, like the 1980s, I think. These are like modeled, like very closely modeled off of reconstructions from uh, Stephen Jay Gould's Wonder Wonderful Life, which is a book that talks all about uh, the Cambrian explosion. Um, they are a bit changed. Um, if you're like a really detailed um, reader, you'll notice that uh, Nectocaris, so he here's a hallucinogenia, and this is Nectocaris. You'll, no you'll notice that uh, Nectocaris is in a slightly different position in uh, Wonderful Life. It's not really like as mobile as I ended up drawing it. Um, it's just kind of like straight. Um, but it, it, it does look very similar to it otherwise. So this is Hallucigenia, um, and this is Nectocaris. So Hallucigenia, uh, they really didn't know what to make of it um, initially, and they thought it looked a bit like this, um, that like it walked on spine legs, and that it had these weird, really weird feeding appendages, feeding appendages at the top. Um, yeah, it was just super confusing. They said, named it hallucinogenia because it was like almost dreamlike because it was so weird. Like how could there exist an animal that looked and fed in such a strange, not like atypical manner, you know? Um, what they got wrong here was two things. They reversed its orientation twice, which is pretty funny. Um, this became more evident as they unearthed more fossils. Um, and they actually found out that they messed up twice. They, um, these these are the feet, and this is, or um, let's see, this is the head. Yeah. So they thought this this end was the head, and these were the feet, and they were completely wrong. In fact, this is the head. This area corresponds to the head now in our modern reconstruction, and these are defensive spines on the back, which makes a lot more sense. And these are the feet. So what happened was they initially discovered the sample in the British Shale. Um, where the leg, like, they couldn't see, um, the paired legs, so they just saw these, like, seven, like, tentacle kind of things, and they're like, oh, they're tentacles, but in actuality, when they, like, look closer at the sample later on, they're like, oh, these are paired, so, I mean, it made sense for them to be legs. Uh, similarly, these things correspond to, like, feeding appendages in our modern interpretation. This area was actually not part of the, uh, our modern reconstruction at all, because they hypothesized this is an artifact from the uh, fossilization process. So basically it's leaked, um, Hussigenia's guts kind of leaked out of like its rear end and thus created this like head shaped kind of um, deal, which actually was, is not part of the um, true shape at all. So yeah, here, here's the modern reconstruction. Uh, you can see I used a hatching to basically like show the uh, like correspondence between certain body parts. Like this is hatched in the same way as the spines. This is hatched the same way as, um, or this is hatched the same way as the legs, and this is um, the head area, right? So here is Nectocaris. So they <laughs> they really messed up with this one initially. They had so little evidence to go off of for this this first example that they imagined it as something with like an arthropod like head and uh, like vertebrate like body, which is really weird. So you get the combination of like an eel, eel with like a, with a shrimp head. So I actually took reference from that. I kind of used like a shrimp head shading to uh, look at this like head portion. Um, what it actually was, was a squid type thing, which is really funny. Um, they found that out when they like for, found more samples of Nectocaris because um, they didn't have much evidence to go on beforehand. But yeah, what it actually has, um, this like kind of head, section surrounding the head portion is in fact the siphon, like a big siphon um, at the bottom of our present reconstruction. These eyes like are correspond similarly and this part I guess uh, corresponds to the tentacles on the front which is pretty interesting. Um, yeah that's piece, uh, that's that's a piece, it's really interesting stuff looking at the procedure of how like paleontologists reconstruct animals um, and how like paleontology is such a rapidly changing dynamic field. Um, here's a piece of 
sketches of Dick and Sonia. So Dick and Sonia is a animal, yeah, animal, um, from the Eddie Akron biota, from, uh, I, I forget which area Dick and Sonia comes from, but it, uh, yeah, the Eddie Akron biota date back, uh, pat, like, even before the Cambrian. So, like, people think the Cambrian is the first era where, like, complex life forms came about, like, complex multicellular life forms. Um, they're not actually right. Uh, the Eddie Akron is where that first uh, happened. And you see that with really complex, or, like, surprisingly complex animals, um, like Dickinsonia, which is also quite difficult to draw. Um, I mean, I went about the uh, concentration with, like, drawing them with glide reflection symmetry, um, which means they're not exactly symmetrical, but if you, like, reflect them, um, you, you basically take one side, shift it down, and reflect it across the other side. That's glide reflection symmetry. So they have that kind of thing going on. You can look it up on, like, Google Images or, like, Wikipedia, and you can see what I'm talking about. But yeah, um, the segmentation is really hard to draw, and I was basically practicing doing that with this piece. Um, I want to do, like, a journal thing just to, like, signify the, I guess, like, the intellectual journey of... Um, figure out certain aspects of Dickinsonia. Like here, uh, he here's just like the line work, of course, but here's also like the the structure, the, the 3D structure kind of exploration. Uh, here's like the movement exploration. So like they, um, Dickinsonia actually moved, they have evidence of that, and they also like think it kind of like shifted along, kind of like an earthworm. Like it would uh, contract and like expand certain parts of its body to uh, get around. And also, I was just discussing like a very simple like uh, fact that there there are a lot of flat organisms during the Ediacaran uh, period, which like kind of comes in like, agrees with the common concept that uh, animals want to optimize uh, surface area to um, volume ratios, um, so that they can get as they can uptake a lot of um, nutrients for uh, set volume. So that one is interesting piece. This is the other piece. I like to think of these as like paired pieces because that one was kind of preparation for making this piece. So this piece I kind of wanted to make a how to draw Dickinsonia kind of thing um, where I'd explain uh, the features that it has. So I talk about glide reflection symmetry here with the text. So here notice that I um, like the, the past three pieces use um, text pretty prominently. Um, this one has kind of a, like, yeah, it has like an asymmetrical composition, which reflects the asymmetry in the animal. And yeah, I kind of give like a guide of how to do that and like discuss other ediacaran organisms that have uh, similar, like kind of, or like the, um, a lot of like isomers, you know, like Charnia, Yorgia, and Spurgina, which are all like really cool looking. Yorgia is very asymmetrical. Um, if you look it up, like the top part is like kind of like this, which is interesting. Yeah, that's that piece. Okay, this piece, this is another lamprey piece. Um, this is actually probably, I think this is the first piece that I made when I decided to make the concentration, which is funny. Uh, I make a good amount of use of uh, compositional techniques. I mean, I kind of have the net, like natural S going on that divides the lamprey from the rest of the um, fish, which is very intentional because lamprey are the only, like, no, they are, they are one of the only two types of fish that lack jaws. The other is hagfish. Um, the reason why they didn't, uh, the reason why they don't study hagfish instead of lamprey for developmental biology is that lamprey are easier to easier to work with. Um, hagfish eggs are huge, and there are not that many, whereas there are a lot for lamprey. And hagfish only lay eggs like once every few few years, um, whereas there are plenty of lamprey to work with. Um, yeah, and here are all the other bony fish that I drew in that are like notable, like the oarfish. Uh, this this isn't necessarily to scale, of course. Orfish are gigantic. Like here's like a shark, coelacanth, um, like salmon, gar, tuna, and orfish. Er, orfish, I said that already. But yeah, um, <coughs> I also played with text in this piece and also drew in the adult uh, phase of the lamprey, which is a fun process. I used stippling for that. Um, yeah, I, I enjoyed making this piece a lot. I also drew in an M seed. So fun fact: uh, lamprey actually have a larval stage. Um, and they under, undergo uh, metamorphosis to achieve their adult, like, parasitic stage that you think of. So actually, there's a bit more than that. So 
um, they reach the M seed stage where they filter feed. Basically, they basically burrow in the mud and they are like sand and like bodies like bodies of water, like rivers and stuff. And and they basically just filter feed for the first few years of their life. And then they undergo metamorphosis. They become like a parasite where they just like suck like fish's blood. And then they undergo the stage where they get even bigger and they stop eating at that phase. And that's when they mate. And then they go up to spawn and the like life cycle repeats. So that's what happens with lamprey. Fun fact. This is a fun piece. So you'll notice I did a very intentional um, radially symmetric composition for this piece. So the reason why is because this piece is about echinoderms. So echinoderms are a group of pentaradially symmetric um, organisms that includes starfish, sea urchins, uh, sand dollars, sea cucumbers, funnily enough, if you look at, like, if you take a cross-section of a sea cucumber, you'll notice it has five-fold symmetry, and, like, sea biscuits, uh, and, yeah, like, many, many more. Sea lilies as well. Actually, no, sea lilies are fine. It's, I, I'm not sure about that. Never mind. <laughs> Don't quote me on that. But, yeah, the, it's, the piece is all about kind of and how, um, they also have a larval stage, um, their larval, larval stage is surprisingly enough a bilaterally symmetri symmetrical, which means they only have um, one axis of symmetry, which is really weird. Of course, like you're like, how how does the sym symmetry change so dramatically? And basically, I use that to um, like what what I do is like I kind of like create a story um, where you read from you start at this point and you read uh, clockwise until you get to the final point, basically. So. I kind of talk about the evolution or the process of development of like a generic um, Pluteus larva um, to the like a like juvenile stage where they kind of like they, they have this uh, part called the imaginal rudiment which is like really important and the metamorphosis of or yeah the, the changing to the like five five-fold symmetry that you see in their adult stage. So like basically once they go through this step, like the imaginal rudiment, I, I think like forms the center of the starfish that you know. And like once it gets to this point or around this point, it kind of looks like a small, just a small starfish and it keeps on growing. Um, yeah, the other thing is you can, like they, they have a good fossil record. So echinoderms have like really interesting like fossil re relatives. So like this, for example, uh, these are cystoids. They they are very asymmetrical. Um, they just look like this your whole lives. I think uh, these are like this is rhinocystis. Um, these are carpoids. I think they're like somewhat bilaterally symmetrical. This is tenocystoid, and uh, this is uh, tino um, tino imbricata imbricata or something. Um, and it has just a very wild like bodily structure. Here I talk about um, like where. Or like basically the point I was trying to make was um, I guess the bilaterally symmetrical stage of the present echinoderm reflects its ancestry. But the other thing is there are actually um, uh, radially symmetric organisms organisms that date back to the Ediacaran. For example, uh, Arcarla, which has uh, fivefold symmetry. Uh, it's not necessarily an echinoderm, but it could be. Um, and uh, Tribrachidium, which has threefold symmetry. There's actually a whole genus. I think of threefold symmet like tri triradially symmetrical organisms called Triplozoa and uh, the Ediacaran biota, which have this threefold threefold symmetry. I don't know if those are kind of related, but that's something interesting to think about. This one, uh, this is oh shoot, uh, this one is a neat piece. Uh, this one is about uh, <clears throat> this one is about the uh, flatfish. So. Uh, the flatfish does a really neat thing where it, um, it's like, you know, the flatfish is being just like flat and having two, two eyes on one side and being like generally asymmetrical because it like lies on one side and the other like kind of looks up. Uh, what happens here in development is their eyes migrate over to the other side. So I used like real time or like I, I used footage, um, with some interpolation of, uh, like a flatfish metamorphosing, uh, undergoing metamorphosis to its adult stage where its eyes like kind of migrate over. I looked at it from both the like this horizontal view and the frontal view um, where it's like I kind of shifts over. It's also very asymmetrical 
again, reflecting the symmetry, using the composition to reflect the type of uh, change in symmetry of the an animal. And yeah, this is another um, like more kind of abstract composition. I kind of thought about like cubism and how they use uh, like repetition to reflect motion or uh, a progression in time, kind of like a new descending a staircase. I'm also a huge JoJo fan, so that helps um, in terms of composition. Uh, tw 11. There's another one I'm working on um, that is interesting. That should, I, I can talk about that soon, but 11 is a piece of uh, Eijiro Cass's Spin Molai, which is a, an anomalic heritage. It's, that means it's related to the famous anomalic Caris, um of the of Burgess of the Burgess Shale, um, but it's a bit more recent. So it's like it's kind of dominant during the Order of Mission, like eight four eighty million years ago, I think, for uh, Adriacasis. Um, and it's a filter feeder, which is really cool. It also has this huge like like care like this like carapace kind of like the like on on the front of its body, it looks a lot like I think it's part of her day. Um, it looks like uh, like Herdia or something. I think it's called, um, which is another anomalic keratin. She has a crazy big carapace as well. But yeah, Adriacasis is huge in real life. It gets up to like two meters or something. It was absolutely insane. Um, and I for this piece, I kind of used like a collage thing to illustrate the process of reconstructing it from its composite parts. So I looked into the nature paper where they um, like talk about it and their reconstruction and I tried to reconstruct it um, from the uh, pieces that they gave. So for example, um, you can see a lot of the pieces in the uh, like fossilized parts of Adriacasis. So like you can see it's like carapace on the top um, and the carina that like lines that is in the middle. So like the carina is kind of like a, um, like a it kind of like, how do I describe it? So it's just the part where it, um, the carapace kind of like comes together at the top. So um, it kind of has that visually going on. And there's also like a carina for the like the lateral element of the carapace as well, which like is reflected by the shading. It also has, also has this little element that sticks out, which is preserved right here. Um, and yeah, it's eyes. I, there wasn't too much detail on, um, but yeah, here are it's like the, the um, mouthpiece that it uses to filter feed. And here's one of the original samples where you can see the spines, or no, sorry, the fins that it uses to swim around. So that was a really cool process. I'm enjoying it so far, and I can uh, let you, or I'll probably upload something talking about the last piece at some point, because it's going to be pretty big, but hope you enjoy this video. See ya.